If our challenge is to find better ways of spreading and making innovation effective, how should we be doing it? Should we be looking to see the most powerful learning innovations going to scale in the same way that the motor car or the tablet computer have? Uh, should governments and people in authority who run public systems be mandating that everybody is required to adopt the most effective innovation? And is there not a, a contradiction in terms with trying to spread innovation in that way? Or do we need an entirely different kind of language and an entirely different toolkit in order to be able to adopt and adapt successfully? Now, how did we really reach, uh, you know, what, what would I attribute to how we managed to scale up to 80,000? I would say it's basically the innov innovative pedagogy that we used in the academic support class, which is based on learning from peers and uh, using the support of trained facilitators. And these are youth from the local community. And because it's very difficult to find qualified teachers in these areas. So the, the curriculum is creative. We basically reinforce academic concepts. And we use a cooperative reflective approach, which is based on group learning, interactive group learning. And the value of this is that it lies in the dynamics, the group dynamics, which are played out in the classroom where the girls are grouped in uh, small groups of three to four. And you, um, you know, encourage them to listen to each other, ask questions, re restate their points of view. And this develops a th thinking skills, higher thinking skills. So what we found is that this can be replicated and has been implemented in nine states in 2,500 classrooms, and the setting could be an urban classroom, it could be a rural classroom, it could be even a tribal classroom where there's no electricity. So we don't rely on technology because there is no access to technology. And also, in India, we have a multitude of languages. So we've managed to adapt it to various languages. Further, we, it's also cost effective because the facilitators are from the local community. So it's just a matter of training them. Innovation is not necessarily new. It can be new, not innovative for the purposes we, we want. You know, the, the formula is very old. The way to get engaged with community, the sense of ownership they develop, the way they feel what that they are doing is tackling a very essential aspect of their everyday life. School is not just go there and fill your memory or fill your memory with things you read. It is the whole process of uh, moving forward, being effective and um, active and resolving the problems that the community is really feeling, and students participate in that. The original Cristo Rey School opened in Chicago in 1996, and from my understanding, I was not involved in that. There was no real thought at that time that the model would be brought up to scale and replicated in other cities. But the original school got a lot of publicity uh, people were very attracted to its mission to provide a, an excellent, rigorous college preparatory education to young men and women from low-income families in our inner cities. And they were intrigued by the uniqueness of our model that each student would work one day a week in entry-level clerical jobs in major corporations. And that would account for approximately 50% 50, 50 of the operating course of the school. So the initial school got a lot of publicity and groups in cities like Portland, Oregon, Los Angeles, and Denver, Colorado asked if they could create a similar kind of school. That happened, then the leaders of those schools and the gentlemen who really made the replication possible by creating a sunset foundation, money that had to be spent within a certain amount of time, got together and they created 10 mission effectiveness standards. So they said if any group wants to come and start a school like Cristo Rey in Chicago, they had to agree to live up to these mission effectiveness standards. And then 
we de they decided that, well, before a new group would come in, they would have to undertake a sophisticated feasibility process. So they would do that at a local level and then go to the national network and ask for permission to join this network. I think what drove the expansion initially was the attractiveness of the mission and the uniqueness of the mission. The question is, what questions do people forget to ask when replicating other models? I think that um, people doesn't always take into account all the resources available that are in front of you but you don't necessarily see that they can serve for your purposes. And so that is one huge thing that you have to do. But beyond that, I think you have to draw from the available knowledge, experience, and wisdom. And nowadays, the big change is that we have technology in our favor. To do that school, it was essential to see what others were doing because the particular uh, aspect of this uh, experience is that it's an NGO taking on a project that means a construction of a one and a half million. States can do that, companies can do that, but an NGO engaged with the community doing such a thing, it's something very new. The question uh, that we uh, actually forgot to ask ourselves, we were so excited that we had managed to do so well at primary school level that we decided to take it up to the secondary school, up to the 10th standard, so then girls would be independent enough and empowered. But at the higher classes, what you just, you, the support of learning facilitators is not sufficient. You do need academically qualified teachers, and that's exactly what there is a shortage of. So then we had to really learn, and we learned the, the hard way, but it was something we forgot to ask ourselves. Okay, so, so you found that you had to undertake a specific adaptation in order to extend the model up, up the age range. Right, exactly. I was going to say, too, the question that we didn't ask, there's a, there's a large difference between adopting and adapting. And we were very happy, you know, that so many groups around the United States wanted to adopt our model. But we didn't ask, how much are we going to let each school adapt our model? Mm. And we've had major uh, issues over the years over adaptation. Uh, and one of the things also that we didn't ask is, I think in any kind of franchising organization or uh, bringing something up to scale, the founders have, have created the model. And how much are they willing to let go of the way they created their model and let another group adapt it? We see here islands of excellence, which is commendable. But have you ever thought about moving to the next level, creating a network between your networks? So therefore, some of the challenges that one system uh, faces, the other one might have a very simple answer. So eventually, we're not moving in different directions with different pockets of excellences. And finally, we move at the level where each of us, we don't reinvent the wheel every time and we make our life a little bit easier, and therefore we spend more energy with the students that we want to serve. I'll just make one final point about finance. Um, when we looked at our innovators, we were very struck about how very early on, and by the way, this is irrespective of whether they operate within a state sector or whether they're fundamentally philanthropic nonprofits, but they were thinking entrepreneurially from the outset. They were thinking about how they might achieve a mix of funding streams and how they might make that sustainable. I think that this spirit of entrepreneurialism, which particularly marks Mr. Abad Dandalusi's work, is going to characterise educators going forward. And I say again, irrespective of whether that's in the state sector or beyond it, because we know that levels of funding in the public services are not going to continue to rise without limit. And I think that we need to consider ourselves as educators as being part of an entrepreneurial class who need to think about education as embedded in our broader civic society in a completely different way. Mm -hmm.